floor operates in human consciousness and human affairs only as spiritual law or spiritual things, spiritual realities, are inwardly discerned with an inner faculty. That is why human beings wonder why they walk around saying disease isn't real, and disease has no cause, and disease is uh, error, and God is all, and nothing happens. Because all of this is on the intellectual plane. It is just like a person who studies music and never does get beyond uh, the mental uh, realm, and they might be able to turn out a beautiful uh, uh, piece of piano playing or singing, and it leaves you stone cold because there's nothing there but mechanical perfection. Music has never touched their soul or come out from their inner being, and so it's just a wonderful piece of mechanism. Well, that is like a lot of better physicians who know all the truths in the book with their mind and can say them all and recite them all, but nothing happens. Now, a spiritual truth, in order to be effective, must be spiritually discerned. That is the meaning of the word faith. Faith doesn't mean blind uh, acceptance of something. Faith doesn't mean saying, I believe in God, or I believe in Jesus Christ, or I believe in spiritual healing. That is not faith. Faith is only faith when it is discernment. There was a surgeon in New York many years ago, Johnny Erdman, who uh, was so good that in order to show his students that it wasn't fingers alone that performed operations, he performed appendicitis operations blindfolded. Yes, he permitted himself to be blindfolded with uh, the operation to show them that there was something deeper to surgery than eyes and fingers. And there is. There is to any business or any profession or any art. There's something more than the mind, and that something more is the soul, the inner capacities. And when you have that, you have a touch that's beyond feeling. You have a vision that is beyond seeing. You have a hearing that is beyond uh, ears. And uh, it is in that that your spiritual power lies. Now, when I say to you that there are no physical causes for disease and there are no mental causes for disease, I'm saying to you that in the realm of the real, in the realm of spirit, there are no such things. And as you come into that discernment, of God as the lawgiver and God as the law and have an actual experience of it, you nullify the so-called material laws and mental laws. Be assured of this, I have seen it work out in uh, practice, not only with individuals, but I have seen epidemics of disease stopped. It is only here two weeks ago that I had the privilege of being called in when there was an epidemic of disease in uh, uh, chicken ranch where the chickens were dying well they were just dropping over every single minute until they were going by hundreds and hundreds and uh, they couldn't they found they knew what it was but they had no cure for it and I was called in and in six hours there wasn't a trace left of it don't forget that I had the same experience in Florida being called into the experimental station when they had a disease among cows, dairy cows, and they couldn't stop it. And I was called in, and in a few hours it was stopped. Why? Let's not uh, quibble. There was something operating on the human level, infection, contagion, disease, whatever it was. But the moment that it was brought in contact with this inner discernment of... Uh, cosmic law as the only law, spiritual law as the only law, this other had no effect because it isn't actual law, it is only law on that, on that level. It's a belief which we accept as a law. Now so it is that you may, without any question of doubt, be under certain mental strains and produce certain mental uh, or physical disorders. But that doesn't mean that that's a law. 
As a matter of fact, it couldn't be a law, as I brought out last night, it couldn't be a law or it would be permanent. Anything that has really a law, the law would sustain, just as the law of mathematics sustains two times two is four. Anything that has a law is sustained by that law eternally. So therefore, these physical causes, mental causes, they're not law in our sense of the word law in any permanent uh, sense. They are accepted by us as law and they operate as law only because of our accept or universal acceptance of it. Now, it isn't your acceptance or mine, it's a universal acceptance. And so there's no use of trying to stop it in your mind. Uh, a few months ago, I was called to a mental institute where one of the psychiatrists very frankly said, we haven't got the answer to these cases. And I'm beginning to search in uh, spiritual teachings to see what can be found there. And of course, those who are familiar with that know that the problems of today are bringing terrible mental strain upon people. Not only with those who have to earn a living above income taxes, that's one full phase of trouble, but when you stop to think of the youth of today who have nothing to look forward to, they know right well that uh, even before they can get through their schooling they're going to be drafted. They don't know whether they're going to come back whole or not whole. They don't know if they can marry. If they do marry, they don't have any degree of permanence about it in their thought because they know right well they don't know if they're going to get a job when they get out of service or they may have to go back into service to get a living. The youth of today is confused with such conditions and you can't wonder at it. Our generation has failed so hard now that those states of confusion should lead them to instabilities, to too much drinking or to dope or to dancing, or too much television. Who can wonder at those things? We've given them a pretty poor world to live in from a human standpoint. And uh, that they go haywire, that they drink too much, that they end up as alcoholics or in different kinds of trouble is not to be wondered at. But the point is uh, that when uh, you are brought to those cases for treatment, if you were to look at those appearances and say, yes, but there's nothing can be done about it because we can't give them a better world, then you are the blind leading the blind. There is a way, though, to help them. And that is, in proportion, as you catch a glimpse of this spiritual law as the all law and only law, you find their whole natures beginning to respond to spiritual impulses and their lives change. You can't do it from the outer. You can't say to them, stop worrying. You can't say to them, stop drinking. If they had the capacity to stop, they would. You can't say to them that uh, you should have hope. You've got nothing to give them hope with. But if you can reach behind uh, what they are thinking, if you can go back to the source of their being, which is spirit, and open a way for it to unfold, they then... Uh, come out into these harmonies. In our work, we have had wonderful success with mental disorders and with alcoholism, but not ever by trying to change a person, not ever by trying to psychologically give them hope or courage or strength, but rather by going behind the scene, and probably before this week was over, is over, you will see how that can be done. I'm only outlining tonight some of these major points that you must see. Now, at this point, you will perceive that our work from the standpoint of prayer or treatment has nothing to do with the individual being treated. In other words, that our work is not directed to you. In other words, you do this or you do that or you read so many pages or you do the other thing. It lies, our work lies in an entirely different direction. It lies in going within our own being and resolving the appearance within ourselves so that 
the degree of our realization becomes evident in the experience of our patient. That is one of the points that we will take up in greater detail as this week unfolds. For the present, let me make it clear to you that this work is not a reaching into a human being's life and trying through any human means, either physical or mental, to change them, improve them, heal them, correct them. This is a work that has its foundation in the spiritual realm and is operative not only in the human world, animal world, vegetable world, mineral world. The Master showed the effectiveness of this in uh, raising the dead. Now, you know, he couldn't say to a corpse, Lazarus, come forth. He couldn't have said to Jairus's daughter, arise. You can't do that to a corpse. There's nothing there to respond to it. He had to get beyond uh, that which was visible and tangible into the soul of the individual and then it could come forth and pick up the body. First it would pick up the mind and then it would pick up the body. So it is with us. You cannot reform a person from the outside either physically or mentally. As a matter of fact, we who have had human faults and failures and failings in our lives can testify to the fact that we'd love to be better. The good that we would, we do not. And the evil that we would not, that we do, in spite of the fact that we'd like to do good. And humanly, we cannot, by repression or suppression, or by willpower, overcome the failings of our humanhood. Even simple things like smoking. Try, those who are addicted to it, try to get rid of smoking by uh, willpower. See how few have ever achieved it. And those few can't guarantee that it will be a permanent thing. But how simple it is with smoking and with drinking, once the spirit has been touched, to see how these things dissolve and uh, leave us. And so that brings us to the third point of importance, and that is prayer. Prayer with its subheading of treatment. You see, everything that we accomplish, we accomplish through prayer or treatment, or prayer and treatment. And so the nature of prayer and treatment must be understood. They are not synonymous. They are two different uh, degrees, uh, probably, of the same idea. But treatment, metaphysical treatment, is something that takes place in the mental realm. It is a knowing of the truth, a conscious knowing of the truth that takes place within us. It is something that we either declare or think or write based on uh, certain principles that we have learned and uh, that we know with our mind. But as I've brought out, that is not the healing agency. The purpose of treatment is not to heal anyone, because it won't do it. It won't reform them, it won't change them. Treatment will lift us. That's why treatment is never directed at a patient. A treatment is only directed at ourselves. And the treatment, the mental process of knowing the truth, the mental process of declaring the principles, that's not for the patient's benefit and it's not for God's benefit, because you can't influence God. It is to lift ourselves above the realm of the mental to where we can be receptive and responsive to the spiritual impulse. In other words, as a human being, I have no access to God. The things of God are foolishness with man. And uh, man whose breath is in his nostril never will become aware of God. But I do have access 
to some what we call truths truth of being they're spiritual truths but I only know them mentally and so in the, my period of treatment I can mentally declare the principle of God as the only cause the principle of God's law as the only law the principle that God's substance is the only substance the principle that the soul of God is individual soul that the mind of God is individual mind that there is but one consciousness and that's God and it's universal and it's spiritual and it's eternal and immortal and nothing from without can enter that consciousness to defile or make a lie I can rehearse mentally these great truths about God and God's kingdom and God's universe and thereby keep lifting myself and lifting myself and lifting myself until I come to the end of speech and thought until I come to a place where there's nothing left for me to say and nothing left for me to think now I enter the atmosphere of prayer now is where I sit back and say father I've had my say now it's your turn speak Lord thy servant hear it now I sit back as a musician does that wants to compose or Edison that wants to invent now I sit back and I become receptive to the inflow from this great universal cosmic storehouse of harmonious being and as I learn to in Browning's language open out a way for the imprisoned splendors to escape as I open out a way by receptivity I'm reaching back into the universal consciousness the divine consciousness the God consciousness which really is the source of my individual consciousness now I may not succeed today tomorrow next week next year in making that contact I may at the first uh, attempt may not I didn't but after I made it the first time it was easy to go back to it then I'm back here now in an atmosphere of prayer you might also call it communion there is now a communion between uh, the individual consciousness and its infinite source there's not two there there's just one but the big father is way back there and uh, I the son can do all things through this uh, father this universal coming into individual expression then as it comes it says thou art my beloved son or it says I will never leave you nor forsake you or it says I am the only law matter of fact upstairs I was meditating for our class tonight I never want to come on a platform unless God gives me some kind of a sign or signal that he's with me because I'd have nothing to give you it is only as I, I know for sure that uh, the connection is well established that I want to come in and so as I sat there and prayed hard when I mean prayed hard father come on come on we we've got to be one tonight don't leave me then all of a sudden out of the blue it said Isaiah 46 9 you may not know what that is I didn't so I had to open the Bible and it says remember the former things of old for I am God and there is none else I am God and there is none like me and I said thank you father I'll go down there and let you be God I don't have to worry as long as you're God our class is going to be well taken care of that's all right with me it had come in you see I am God and there's none else there's none beside me so you don't have to worry about anything don't play God just go down there and open your mouth and let me come through now that is prayer 
and that is answered prayer you've heard me say before there's no such thing as unanswered prayer no there are lots of treatments that don't work there are lots of healings that don't take place because we don't get into the depth of prayer we don't get into that communion where God speaks when we do something usually happens when it doesn't there are things at work that at that particular moment cannot be brought into alignment with uh, that thing the master referred to some of those when he said neither do I condemn you but go and sin no more lest a worse thing come upon you in other words you can get all of the healings you want but if there isn't some change of consciousness within you you go right back to the old way of uh, thinking and believing and the same old penalties will come upon you or sometimes the time element is there in God there's no time but in our unfoldment there is and so you cannot send a, a ten-year-old to college not many of them anyhow because there is a time element which isn't time at all it's unfoldment they cannot be ready for college until there has been a sufficient unfoldment within them that will make the college subjects intelligible to them so you say oh they have to be 16 years of age no it isn't the age it's the degree of unfoldment but the degree of unfoldment usually takes them to 16 years of age now it is in the same way that as far as God is concerned we could all be wonderful pianists I tried for two years and couldn't get the first base the time element is one of unfoldment other people in two years can do pretty well I couldn't because my musical consciousness wouldn't unfold hasn't done much better in 20 years but that's neither here nor there that's one of my misfortunes now as a rule though when uh, you get into that atmosphere of prayer where you have risen above the letter of truth where you have reached a place where you're no longer declaring truth or thinking truth but where you are receptive to truth then comes the divine impulse and it says turn to the right go ye this way and enter it gives you the cue of healing it gives you the right word to say or no word at all just the divine impulse and the healing takes place whatever the nature of that healing must be physical mental moral financial but you see it all comes because I am God because behind this uh, individual selfhood is the universal selfhood flowing as the individual and only when the contact is established is the power of God in operation as humans we are cut off from it the mind cuts us off the word I cuts us off we say I can do this or I can't do that I know this or I don't know this and so that word I uh, uh, cuts us off from our source the moment we have gotten that I out of the way to where we recognize well I Jesus am uh, the uh, unfoldment of God and so the father within me Jesus operates through me Jesus to do the work so then we come to that same place where we say I Joel can do nothing not all the truth I could know would help anybody now all the thoughts I could think not all the good thoughts I could think about them would help them and all the evil thoughts I could think about them wouldn't hurt them but the moment I can think no thoughts and can let the flow come through then uh, God itself touches you that's where the healing comes I have been the instrument only through which the universal flow has uh, become individualized then any individual with that has the whole power and presence of the Godhead bodily in proportion to their clarity in other words in proportion to their transparency the, the, the uh, clearness 
with which they're enabled to get away from thoughts and, and uh, things and come through. Now, the more you know of treatment, the more you know of the correct letter of truth, and by that I mean the more you get back, even intellectually, to knowing that God is the only lawgiver and therefore God is the only law, God is the only substance, the only cause, therefore good is the only effect. The more you get back to those basic principles and the more you know of them and the more you can realize them, declare them, think them, the more you will lift yourself into the atmosphere above thought, above words and thoughts, to where the activity of God itself comes through. But in the early stages, remember, it is necessary to know the truth. It is necessary to know as much of the truth as you can. It is necessary to know the truth accurately, not declare it correctly one day, not say one day God is the only cause, and then the next day say, I wonder what sin I'm committing that's bringing this on. Now you're setting up a conflict within uh, yourself. If one day you have God as the only cause, and the next day you have sin as the cause, or ignorance or fear as the cause, you're just setting up a conflict within yourself. You must understand a principle and adhere to it. When you're told, have, uh, call no man your father on earth, it doesn't mean you're to dis disrespect your human parents, but it does mean that somewhere inside of you, you realize that spirit is a creative principle, and that that is the causative principle of your being, and that is the only causative principle, and therefore only that which emanates from that causative principle can appear in effect. Now the appearances may not testify to that, but that is why you're learning this truth. And as you hold that in your consciousness, since God is spirit and God is the Father, God is the only causative principle, all that can uh, take place in me is an emanation of that perfect spiritual cause. As you maintain that, even mentally, intellectually within you, eventually you rise to where it becomes faith or spiritual discernment. Then it becomes a law unto you, and uh, you go forth free. Now remember this. It says that those who dwell in the secret place of the Most High, none of these evils shall befall them. But it does say that a thousand shall fall at my left and ten thousand at thy right. No use denying error. No use saying there is no such thing. Because there you have it in Scripture. A thousand shall fall here. Ten thousand shall fall here. Who are not living, uh, dwelling in this truth, in this spiritual truth. The Master says the self-same thing in uh, the 15th chapter of John. It's very clear, very clear. Gives you the same thing, just uses a few different words, but uh, the same idea. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself except it abide in the vine, no more can ye. You can't do it. You can't live to yourself. I am the vine and ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. You see, again, if you live in the secret place of the Most High, you are under the life, government, and guidance of this cosmic law. If you cut yourself off from it and start to have God's many idols start to fear dollars out here or love them, start to fear things out here or love them, start to make unto you creatures to worship, you're cutting yourself off from this infinite invisible and then you'll be the withered branch. You might live three score years and ten, and you might not. You might live them healthily, and you might not. 
human life is a matter of luck, accident, chance. There's no such thing as law in the human world. A doctor could get you 100% healthy tomorrow and you could come back to him dying the next day. He can't help that. He can't do anything about it either. He can get you healthy up to a certain point in, and sometimes perfectly healthy in physical experience, but it's up to you what happens after that. Why? For the simple reason that there are laws of life, and if you violate them, there's nothing he can do about it. So there are spiritual laws of life, and uh, you can be healed. You can be forgiven your sins. But uh, don't go and sin again, lest the worst thing come upon you. And so it is, the moment you realize that as a human being, you live the life of a branch that's been cut off from its tree. There's life in it. The branch will live for a while after it's cut off from the tree. It'll live and keep using up that life. It may, if it gets in water, even draw some life out of the water and continue for a while. But ultimately, it's got to die. Now, so with us, if you feed yourself well, you can live by bread for a while, air, sunshine, but only for a while. Unless you get to a place where you do not live by bread alone, you're living as a withered branch. We have a good example of that in the greatest physical culturist there is in America. He's 82 and looks like 122. He's a sorriest looking spectacle to look at for a man who's devoted 60 years of his life to being the perfect physical body. Surely, surely he eats the right bread. He eats the right vegetables and the right fruits. He lives by bread alone and looks at too. We do not live by bread alone. It doesn't mean we neglect food, and it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be seeking the right food, nor does it mean that when we find them that we shouldn't give up the wrong foods, because uh, all food really isn't food. A lot of it is just bulk. But so far as food is concerned, we should eat it, and we should eat rightly, we should eat correctly, but don't think for a minute that... Uh, by right food or right air or right exercise that uh, your life is going to be other than a physical thing. That's all it can be. Now we do not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. If you abide in me and let my words, the word of God, abide in you, let this truth abide in you, then you'll find not only that the Spirit itself gives you life and life eternal, but the Spirit itself acts upon the food you eat and makes them uh, nourish you even to a greater extent than they would in and of themselves. Now, there are experiments going on right now in uh, Europe and in America to see what effect prayer has on uh, crops and gardens, quite an organization carrying on these experiments in Europe and in America. And they're testing out with prayer. I don't know what kind of prayers they're using, but uh, they have ministers to do the praying to find out what effect prayer has. Well, we who have been in metaphysics for a long time could tell them all the answers. It has a wonderful effect. We can make two blades of grass grow where one grew before. We can make any kind of a crop be 20, 25, 30% greater without the addition of one uh, outer form of uh, fertilizer or food merely by prayer. Just the same as we've been able to maintain health of body and health of mind only by prayer. So we have been able to prove in the vegetable world and animal world the self-same thing. And now, of course, the same principle is being used in capital labor relations to prove that you can even bring harmony out of a, a capital labor argument. Of course you can. No question about that. Not with psychology, with prayer. Now, 
to those who live in the secret place of the Most High, that means who live in this consciousness of God's allness, God's being, to those who abide in the word of truth, who let the word abide in their consciousness. Paul over here in the eighth chapter of Romans, chapter of Romans for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh but they that are after the spirit the things of the spirit for to be carnally minded is death but to be spiritually minded is life and peace now, of course religion has interpreted that to mean uh, for to be carnally minded uh, something of a sensual or lustful nature and it doesn't mean that at all it means actually to, and he brings it out here in the same uh, chapter, what it really means is that if you sow to the flesh, you will reap corruption. In other words, if you live only by bread, if you live only to the physical needs and uh, mental needs, then uh, you uh, are on the way to death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind the human mind, the mortal mind, the material mind, is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor neither indeed can be. And so it is. The materially minded man or woman, in the degree of that material mindedness, is cut off from God and from the influence of the spirit. And they don't realize that it is disobedience to a cosmic law. Now, this is the secret of cosmic law. Cosmic law is love. Love is the fulfilling of the law. And when you understand the nature of love, you will know what to be obedient to. And uh, then... Uh, you will be consciously one with all the forces of spirit of the cosmic mind, of the cosmic law, of the cosmic consciousness, but only through love. And I'm not talking about sentiment or emotion. Love. We will take up love as we go on because there is the only way in which we can come into obedience to the cosmic laws that enable us to say that none of these evils shall come nigh my dwelling place because I live in the secret place of the Most High. I live and move and have my being in God. I do not live by bread alone, but by love, by spirit, by my divine nature, by the divine in my nature. And so we read... But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. What is the spirit of God? He told us love is the fulfilling of the law. Love. Love one another. Love me. Love my commandments. Love uh, your fellow man even as I have loved you. Love thy neighbor as thyself. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. Love. You can know whether you're in obedience to uh, cosmic law. Are you loving God or seeking God for the demonstration's sake? Are you seeking God merely for the God contact and experience or merely because God is a means to getting a healing? You can tell whether you have cosmic law working with you. What is the degree of your love to your fellow man? There is where our psychologist friends and psychosomatic friends have rightness on their side. In the human picture, if you are bearing hatreds, enmities, jealousies, 
you're upsetting the whole apple cart of your mind and of your body. It isn't law, no, it isn't law and it isn't cause, except while you are on that level of life. Then it becomes a law unto you. And then they have the hard time to uh, get that hate, enmity, jealousy out of you. They know what it's doing it to you, but they don't know how to get it out of you. That's been the tough part of it. We know what it is, but we don't know how to get it out. Because telling a person to be more loving, kind, generous isn't going to make him so. It can only come when a love of God has developed in man. And that's why it's a, an unfortunate thing to see how many people are condemned to their ills and can't help themselves because you can't automatically generate a love of God in your heart until your time has come. There does come a time in the experience of every individual when a love of God develops, not merely a fear of God. I don't mean that thing that happens to people when they pass 50 and start in to wonder how soon their time has come and they're going to take up a little religion. I don't mean that kind of love of God. I really mean the, the love of God, that desire in here for fulfillment, for inner fulfillment. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. But if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. There you have the secret of the cosmic law and also how to attain it. You see, if ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, not if ye through repression or suppression or through trying to be good or making a mental effort. No, no, no. If through the Spirit. If through what may first take the form of treatment and then later prayer, if through an actual inner communion with God you get the flow of God within you, then the deeds of the body are mortified. They're not mortified by repression. They're not mortified by suppression. They're not mortified by honesty is the best policy. No, no, no. They are mortified as we open ourselves and the Spirit does come in. And it comes in through our practice of meditation. As I've said, treatment leading up to prayer and communion, opening out this way so that the whole of the Godhead flows as our individual being. Oh, I think that is about our story. One more thing. During this week, whatever questions come to your mind, write down and let me have. I'll be glad to answer any of them for which I have answers. Those that I haven't, I'll be glad to tell you so. But, so as to keep the atmosphere of our room the way it is, we do not have any discussions or open periods, but feel free to write out as many questions or all of the questions that you like, and I'll do the best with them for you based on experience and revelation. And so, thank you and good night.